And so, without further ado, we're going to step right into the gladiators arena uh, with our first brave soul. Um, and I'll give you uh, uh, some bio information for each of the speakers here this morning. But please, when you see them around, if you see them at lunch, uh, thank these guys for coming out and stepping forward and speaking on each of these things. You know, we all know you've been out there discussing these things with other people. You've been on the internet. You know how uh, heated these things can get, how divisive these things can get. But yet these men still uh, volunteer to do this. So please thank them uh, and pray for them that uh, they continue to grow in Christ and in their understanding of these things. And if you disagree with them, then pray that they come to a correct understanding so that we can all finally be unified. But no, no, our, our first uh, speaker this morning is Zach McHugh. Uh, he lives here in Kendallville, Indiana with his wife, Becky, and their two beautiful daughters, Evelyn and is it Lilia? Lila. Lila, thank you. Uh, Zach graduated from Grace College with a degree in biblical studies and is currently on staff at Fairview Fellowship Church here in Kendallville. Uh, he's passionate about the Word of God. He loves to study, he loves to teach and to preach the Word. He believes that what we believe about the end times has direct implications for how we live and how we serve Jesus. It's therefore worth studying and knowing what it is that you believe. And he will be talking this morning on dispensational premillennialism. So without further ado, please welcome Zach. Good morning. My name is Zach, excited uh, to have the opportunity to kick off the conference uh, with one of the four views. Got the opportunity to meet at El Mariachi's 2 and meet uh, many of the other speakers that will be at the conference. And uh, I, along with you, am praying for their salvation. So, uh, no, really, really excited. Great guys. I uh, got to meet their wives as well this morning, and uh, that shirt is awesome. Her husband has won an a million. <laughs> Sorry I stole your joke, but it's so good. <laughs> so... Uh, cool. We're going to jump in here, uh, but uh, I'll be the first of four different views that will be shared, dispensational uh, premillennialism. That's over 10 syllables. It's, uh, it's a little bit overwhelming, I'm sure. Uh, but whether you came in here today believing one of those four views or saying, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we, you have a camp as well. You're what we call a pan-millennialist. You believe that everything's going to pan out in the end. And, uh, and you kind of leave it to God. I don't think that's the camp that you should stay in. I think it's important to know what we believe and why we believe it. Indeed, God will work out everything in the future, regardless of which of the four it is, or maybe something entirely different. Um, but I think it's, there's, there's importance to knowing what we believe and why we believe it when it comes to the Word of God. And the Word of God certainly presents uh, much information regarding end times. Uh, thankfully, uh, we're, we read the book of Revelation uh, for end times, and it's loaded with uh, a lot of difficult uh, passages to interpret. Um, but a lot of the end times information that we get comes from the Old Testament prophets, uh, and as well as uh, the New Testament in books such as Matthew and the Gospels and uh, some, some, many of the epistles, First Thessalonians. And, and the like. And so uh, we can uh, put together uh, very well-formulated beliefs, and I think all of the four speakers uh, will do good in that regard. So what is meant by dispensational premillennialism? Uh, that's a, those, are, those are two really, really big words. Premillennial uh, refers to the timing of the rapture. Uh, what I believe in regards to that, it, we, I believe that the rapture uh, the, the, the catching up of believers into heaven will, will take place before the millennium. And then what separates myself um, from historic uh, this, uh, uh, premillennialism, among other things, uh, is that I believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. And I'll explain all of these terms here in just a moment. Uh, in addition to that, the dispensational may be what more caught you off guard. I'm not going to go too deep into that. Uh, but dispensationalism is a hermeneutic. It's a way to interpret scripture as a whole. So it's not specific to, to eschatology or end times. Uh, however, uh, some of the things that are distinct about dispensationalism is that it has a very consistent and literal uh, interpretation uh, of God's word. Uh, and it is uh, very, it believes that the Old Testament prophecies concerning 
uh, national and ethnic Israel will be fulfilled uh, to national and ethnic uh, Israel. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it believes that the New Testament church is, is separate from Israel. That for a time, uh, the New Testament church has been grafted in. Romans 11 uh, has been grafted into uh, Israel uh, and to God's people. But that is- Israel remains a separate entity uh, of God's people. Uh, there are a number of different dispensations on, depending on who you talk to. Uh, dispensation is just a period of time. And d- depending on who you're talking to, some will go as low as four, some will go as high as uh, into the teens. Uh, most agree on seven. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of those, but just for an example, uh, we often see uh, four areas in, within every dispensation. A responsibility is given to mankind by God. There is a failure to meet up to that standard. There is a judgment that takes place, and there is grace to move on. So, for instance, uh, the age of innocence uh, with Adam and Eve, they were given a responsibility. Do not eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Care for the ground. uh, Be fruitful and multiply. They failed. There was judgment, and then there was grace to move on. Uh, we see that along. Uh, oftentimes within the uh, last part, though, of, of dispensationalism, the last dispensation is often referred to as the millennial kingdom. Uh, I believe in a, a literal thousand-year reign of Christ uh, that will take place, and, uh, and we'll get to that. So as I mentioned, the book of Revelation is it's, it's, it's difficult uh, to understand. It's diff- difficult to interpret. But might I suggest that uh, the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, was seeing things that were yet 2,000 years removed or more removed from him. And so he's using the language and the things of his day to describe things that were yet 2,000 years uh, removed. Uh, imagine even 100 years ago, someone trying to describe what they see today. Uh, a computer, a cell phone, an automobile, an Apache helicopter. Uh, a, a, a gun that is so technologically advanced as it is today. Imagine even 50 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, I've been alive for 31 years, but when I was 11 years old, if I saw a phone from today, back then, I would have no idea what it really was or its capabilities. And so uh, 2,000 years of history, at least, that, that the apostle is looking forward to and seeing visions of, uh, that's not to say that, that he's not describing real things. He's just limited in his vocabulary uh, and limited in his understanding to be able to describe things that are yet, uh, yet future. And so I think that's part of the difficulty that we'll get into uh, as we move on. So uh, if, you have, if, you're take, if you're someone that's taking notes, uh, I, I'm not going to draw anything uh, and I don't have any handouts. I'm going to encourage you to kind of draw a timeline. Just draw a line, and we're going to insert some things. I'm going to give you a really, really quick timeline as to what dispensational premillennialists believe, and then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into each aspect uh, that we see there on the timeline. In 6 to 4 BC, uh, most scholars agree that Jesus Christ was born. Uh, so Jesus Christ was born before Christ. Kind of funny. Uh, or before Common Era for those that prefer to, to view that way. Uh, Jesus then, uh, most scholars agree, was crucified in 33 AD, uh, and uh, his death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel, and regardless of what you believe about eschatology, it is the gospel that we can, uh, that we can stand on and that matters more so than anything else, uh, and all the speakers here are certainly in agreement uh, on that. Uh, in addition, uh, then we have uh, this Acts 1, and the disciples say, will you now at this time establish uh, the kingdom? They, 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 they longed for the Messiah who would come and establish the kingdom on earth. And, and, and Jesus says, it's not, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. And he gives the Great Commission uh, in Matthew 28, as well here in Acts 1. And we have what was largely unknown to uh, the Old Testament and to the, the people of that time, what we call the parenthetical church age. And so on your timeline, you have 6 to 4 B.C., you have 33 A.D., and you can do a little bit of a bracket there. It's going to represent at least a 2,000-year period uh, that we refer to as the church age. Uh, it began at Pentecost, 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Jesus appeared to many uh, 
showing that he was indeed resurrected, ascends into the clouds. The believers are gathered at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends on the believers, and it says 3,000 were added to the church that day, and then through a series of missionary efforts that have taken place now throughout the last 2,000 years, and that we are continuing to be a part of, uh, we see this, this church age. But now we're going to get into what we uh, refer to as the, the, end, the end times. If you have your Bibles, I want to open up to Revelation. Go to Revelation 1. So, for the sake of your timeline, we're going to continue to go quickly through that, and then we're going to dive a little bit deeper in. Uh, the next thing I believe that we are awaiting regarding the end times, the Bible says, uh, unless you're a post-millennial, uh, you, be- you believe that the Bible says that uh, things are going to continue to get worse and worse, and, and I think that we see that uh, in, today's, um, in today's world. And so, um, we see... Uh, that the rapture will take place. The rapture means to be, to be caught up. We believe that Jesus will appear in the clouds and that we will rise with him. Those who are in the ground and those that have passed away first, uh, and then those that have, are still alive will also be caught up and go into heaven with him to be forever. Again, I'm going to go into all of these in more depth, but just for the sake of the timeline, the rapture will take place uh, and the church will be uh, removed from the earth. Following that... Uh, we have the Bema seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, we see that in 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, and uh, it is a judgment of believers. So not a judgment of condemnation, but a judgment of reward and of faithfulness. Uh, again, we'll dive deeper into that. Following that, and, and not much further after the rapture, we don't know exactly how much time will, will elapse, but the Antichrist will uh, have a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel, and that will begin what is referred to as the tribulation period. And so uh, a smaller bracket uh, is a seven-year tribulation period. And in the middle of that, the Antichrist will declare himself to be God, and then will break the peace treaty with Israel. And the last half is worse than the first half, which was already bad. Uh, And it's referred to as the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation. Uh, following that, at the end of the, the, the seven-year period, we have uh, the second coming of Christ. So the rapture isn't referring to the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is taking place after uh, the tribulation period. And Christ will come, and we refer to as the Battle of Armageddon. The word Armageddon is only found in Revelation 16.16. 16, 16, uh, and is described in Revelation 19. Uh, but it will be a battle, a very short-lived battle. Again, we're going to dive deeper into that. Uh, but that will take place. And at the Battle of Armageddon, uh, we also have the, the second of the three judgments of the end times. We have the, something referred to as the sheep goat judgment. It's in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And, and God will separate the sheep, being those that are believers, and the goats that are unbelievers. Those that are sheep will go be the ones that go and live into the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. And so again, if you're on this timeline and you're drawing it along with me, you can draw a bracket and there's a thousand-year literal reign of Christ uh, that will take place on earth, uh, largely in fulfillment of the promises to the nation of Israel that were given unconditionally in the Old Testament, and, and, and that will take place. Satan will be bound. Again, we're going we're gonna to talk about some of the, the details here in just a moment. This is just for the sake of the timeline. At the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, Satan will be unbound uh, for a short time. We'll make a, a last hurrah. Again, very, very, very short-lived. Um, it's not the Hollywood picture of this back and forth battle. It is Jesus speaks and it is done. Uh, we have the great white throne judgment following that. Uh, this is a judgment of unbelievers. It is a judgment uh, of condemnation. Uh, we, will, we will talk uh, again more in depth about that. And then following that, I believe there will be a creation of a new heavens and new earth. Uh, and what we refer to as the eternal state. Uh, doesn't give us a whole lot of details as what will take place during that eternal state. Uh, but it will be a great time for those that have trusted in, in God as their Lord and Savior. So, timeline. A lot of history all in one. A lot of uh, future looking forward. Uh, but let's, let's dive into Revelation and look with me in verse 19. Revelation 1 verse 19. Jesus speaking says, Write therefore the things that you have seen... 
those that are and those that are to take place after this. Here, he kind of gives us that, that, that three-point message of what the book of Revelation is going to be about. It is the things, uh, let me look here, the, the things that you have seen, so, so that's past tense, things that have already taken place, right? Secondly, the things that are, are so what, what's presently happening, and then the things that are to take place after that. Uh, the, the, the things that, that have been, I think you're referencing there to Revelation 1. And it's this, this image of the glorified Christ and, and the, the Apostle John falls on his feet and worships uh, the risen Christ. Following that, we have the, the things that uh, the are. And I think that's described there in, uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, I learned a new acronym just recently. Uh, that we have the seven churches, uh, which would have been churches present day in John's, uh, at, the, at the time of John's writing. And uh, the acronym is, Everybody Sing Please, That Sounds Pretty Lovely. Everybody Sing Please, That Sounds Pretty Lovely. And it's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Pergamum Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And each of these seven churches uh, would have been uh, real churches that he was writing to. He said, hey, this is what you're doing well. This is what you are not doing well. And here's the judgment that's coming upon you if you do not uh, repent of the things that you are not doing well. We see that pretty much as a, 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 a form fit for each of the churches. There's some slight differences there. Um, but the things that are. In Revelation 3.10, I think we do get a small picture of, 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 of a, an allusion to the rapture. Uh, and he's speaking here to the church in Philadelphia. But he says, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. This hour of trial, I believe, is a reference to uh, a much longer period than a literal hour, but a, a seven-year uh, tribulation period. In Revelation 4.1 then, uh, after chapters 2 and 3, we never see the word church again in Scripture. And from 4 to 22, uh, I think it chronicles for us the things that will take place after this. Read verse 4.1. After this, I looked. After this, I looked. If you look back in Revelation 1.19, he says... Those that are and those that are to take place after this. Meta tauta is the Greek. The things that will take place after the things that are taking place right now. The things that will take place after this. Those same Greek words, meta tauta, after this, it, it's right there. And so after the church age, after these, th- this time, I looked and behold, a door was standing open to heaven. The first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must must take place after this. I think this is a beautiful imagery of what will take place at the rapture. And I think this is indeed a a reference to this. We're going to look back at 1 Thessalonians 4, which is the most commonly used. uh, But I wanted to give a couple points of reference. And so the imagery here is of of heaven being opened. The believer saying, come and... Uh, and then I will show you what will take place after this. And so then we see the, the unfolding of uh, the rest of the end times. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians, if you have your Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The word rapture is not used in the Bible. Uh, the word trinity and several other words uh, that are theological words, uh, which we would believe in, are also not found. And so I don't think that's in and of itself a reason not to believe uh, in the rapture. Uh, but uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who sleep. They may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, though Jesus, through Jesus, God will bring with those with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel, 
and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And this is referring to the dead of the church age. The, the resurrection of the Old Testament things will take place uh, later than this. And then, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, which is literally what the word rapture means, rapturo, and to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Uh, the titles of chapters are not inspired of themselves, but in my Bible, which is the, the English uh, Standard Version, uh, chapter 5, it says the day of the Lord. Uh, the day of the Lord sometimes refers to just a, a single day, but typically I believe it is in reference to the entire seven-year tribulation period. And so uh, we see the rapture here taking place before uh, the tribulation, as well as the fact that the word church is not mentioned after chapter 3 of Revelation. Uh, I think, again, points to the fact the tribulation has been spoken about in detail from chapter 6 to chapters uh, 19 in Revelation. But the fact that the churches are in 2 and 3 and then not seen after, I believe in a pre-tribulational, not only a pre-millennial, but a pre-tribulational rapture uh, of, of the church prior to uh, the tribulation and then of Christ's second coming. The, the, the next thing that we see on, on the timeline, and we'll go back to Revelation, but the next thing we see, and it's not specifically here mentioned in Revelation, is uh, I believe that there will be the judgment of believers. Uh, if you're familiar with, with this, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, it's referred to that, I believe, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Uh, and it says that all will come before Christ and be judged according to whether they have done good or bad. And the word bad there uh, doesn't necessarily mean refer to a moral evil because we know that believers will not be condemned or judged for their sin. Uh, but the things that they did good and the things that they did that, were, that had no eternal significance. Uh, we then see this in 1 Corinthians 3, which uh, if you're following along in your Bible, I'll encourage you to flip there. In 1 Corinthians 3, uh, Paul's talking and addressing the uh, the, the divisions that were taking place in the Corinthian church. But in the midst of it, uh, he's talking about, hey, some are saying, I follow Paul, and some are saying, I follow Apollos, and some are saying, and, and he said, no, is Christ divided? Of course not. He says, it's, uh, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Um, and so, uh, beyond that, though, then, he says, according to the grace, look here in verse 10, in 1 Corinthians 3, according to the grace given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds on it. So speaking here to believers, the foundation here, which would be Christ, and that's in verse 11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. But then it says we have this responsibility to build upon this foundation. It says, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day, capital D, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test which sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. This, I believe, is a reference uh, and a picture of what will take place at the judgment seat of Christ, at the, uh, at the Bema seat of Christ. Bema is the Greek word for elevated platform. Picture uh, Olympics. And whether you're, if you're on the podium at the Olympics, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, a, good, a good thing, right? That's something to celebrate. This is going to be a, a, a good time. And some, uh, and all believers, are called to build upon the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones. Things that have eternal significance. Uh, things that are really, really important. A couple nights ago, I was looking to unplug a little bit by plugging in. And so I think I played a video game. Will I be rewarded in heaven for that time? Answer, probably not. Otherwise, I got a whole lot of rewards coming. Uh, <laughs> but if it was just a, a quick thing, may, maybe not a simple thing, but just, just something to unplug for a short time after a long day of work, uh, it's, 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 it's that, uh, that wood, hay, and straw. It's the things that when they're tested by fire, they will not remain on the foundation. On the flip side, the things that we do that are good, and not only good, but the things that we do good for the right intentions are that gold, silver, precious stones. They're the things that though tested by fire will remain and that we will be rewarded for. 
And it's not this, hey, I get to harbor all these treasures in, in heaven. It's this, hey, we get to lay these at the feet of Jesus along with the 24 elders who are casting their crowns at Jesus' feet. Uh, what an what a incredible opportunity to, to praise God through the offering of our gifts, which is something we're still called uh, to do today. So we have the, the judgment seat of Christ. It is not a judgment of condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. But this is a, a judgment, uh, I think, uh, if you look back in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we, here it is, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I think that we will be rewarded uh, based on our faithfulness to what the things that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so this is a, a, ju- a judgment of, of rewards and, uh, and, and a good thing. Following that, uh, this will likely obviously take place in heaven. On earth, uh, shortly after the rapture, we'll have the tribulation period. Uh, but to, to not skip over verses 4 and 5, we have this uh, imagery. In chapter 1, we have this vision of Christ. In chapters 2 and 3, we have this, this discussion of the seven churches. Uh, everybody sing, please. That sounds pretty lovely. Good acronym to remember. Uh, he, he addresses the seven churches. And then we get caught up in verses 4 and 5 to this heavenly uh, throne room in this picture here. And all the people are going around and saying, how can, how can this continue on? How can we continue to see the things that will take place in the future? How will end times continue to unravel? Who is unworthy to open the seal? And worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. And people are crying out, worthy is the Lamb. Jesus is the one who is worthy to uh, break open the seal. And we see the unraveling of uh, the judgments that will take place uh, in uh, in Revelation and in the end times. So the, the tribulation, uh, tribulation is a, as a word we use today, it's, it's a hard time. Uh, I often refer to it as it'll be somewhat akin to, to hell on earth. It will not be uh, an enjoyable time. It will be a time of judgment. Uh, it will be a time of, of devastation. And by the end of it, the world as we know it is irrecognizable. Uh, and the first set of judgments referred to as the seals, we see a fourth of the world is destroyed. By the, by the trumpets, which is the second waves of judgment, we see that a third of the remaining uh, world uh, after the fourth has been destroyed is now destroyed. And then by the bowls, which is the, the second wave of seven judgments, uh, we'll see uh, just dev- devastation over the entire world. All of the fish of the sea uh, dead and a number of catastrophic uh, judgments on the earth um, that does not leave, leave survivors, but uh, many, many have perished uh, at this time. Uh, as mentioned, 1 Thessalonians 5 refers to the day of the Lord. The whole book of Joel and the Old Testament is dedicated, uh, the whole three chapters is dedicated to the day of the Lord. Uh, again, I don't refer, think that this is referring to a, a single day, but rather to the seven-year uh, tribulation period. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it talks about a 70th week. And I'm, uh, we don't, I don't have time in 45 minutes to dive too deep into Daniel chapter 9. Uh, but we would say, uh, those that believe in dispensational premillennialism, that 69 of those weeks, uh, seven-year periods, is what the week, word weeks there refer to, those, that 69 of those have been fulfilled uh, and would have culminated in AD 33 with the, with the, the, the raising, uh, the death and resurrection of Christ, and that they're still waiting one week period. Uh, you can dive into, into Daniel 9, and maybe we'll have the opportunity to do that during our panel discussion a little bit further uh, but in Daniel chapter 9, we see this final week, and I believe that week is referring here to uh, the tribulation period. In chapter 6, if you're not there yet, uh, we see the seven seals. And I'm borrowing from one of uh, the guys that I've had as a teacher uh, and as a mentor at different times. I had the opportunity to go to Israel. Uh, but there's this scroll, and as, as he unrolls the scroll, we see a seal. And then we, as he unscrolls further, we see a seal and then a seal, and there's seven seals, but on the last seal, we see it's actually just opening up the next waves of judgments. And so with each, with each seal broken, we see these levels of, uh, of things that take place, and 
we see uh, in, in verse 4, for instance, and, another, uh, and out came a horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that the people should slay one another and was given a great sword. The third seal, I heard the living creature come and, and, and I looked and behold a black horse and this rider had a pail of scales in his hand and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of four living creatures say, a quart and a wheat for denarius and three quarts of barley for denarius and, uh, and I did not harm and do not harm the oil and wine. These judgments are coming along with each seal being broken but as the sixth or seventh seal is broken, it actually just unleashes uh, the next wave of judgments being uh, the bowls. At the end, though, of chapter uh, 6, or 7, 6 and 7 really describe what takes place, uh, or 6 describes what takes place here uh, in the uh, uh, first wave of judgments referred to as the seals. We have uh, chapter 7, which refers to as the 144,000. Uh, the 144,000 we have uh, is everyone that enters into the millennial, uh, the, the tribulation period is an unbeliever. All the believers have been raptured up, and yet God is still not done with his mission. And so he redeems 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, 12,000 times 12, 144,000. And these are Jewish missionaries who go and proclaim the gospel to the world. They are also granted protection for a time from Satan and from evil uh, and are not allowed to die uh, until later on in Revelation chapter 14 where many of them become uh, martyrs. But they go and they're doing uh, the Lord's work. Then we see the trumpets that take place uh, and we see uh, a lot of other things uh, that are taking place uh, here. As we, as we continue on, we see the seventh seal, which again opens up the seven trumpets. And so there in chapter 8, we have the seven trumpets, and they're, and they're referred to here and talked about in chapter 8 and 9. Uh, 10 talks uh, a little bit about uh, another scroll. But then in chapter 11, we have the two witnesses. I'm not going to dive too deep into this because I'm, I'm limited on my time. But the two witnesses, I believe, are referring to uh, Elijah and Moses. Uh, if you read through the Bible, there's something really significant about Elijah and Moses. Uh, Elijah uh, was one who, who prayed that it would not rain for three and a half years. And we see some controlling of weather here by him. Uh, and Moses is the, is the lawgiver. And we see that here of the second witness. Uh, in the Old Testament, Elijah was said to be taken up into the clouds, uh, not dying. Uh, so it's significant here that he's, he's coming back. Uh, and then in uh, Moses, we see that the body of Moses is disputed over by the angels and demons in the New Testament. And I think, again, that is for this particular purpose, that they are coming back uh, to be the two witnesses. Uh, part of this purpose, I believe, with Elijah and Moses being two very significant Old Testament prophets, will be to call the Jews back to salvation. So not only has he redeemed 144,000 Jews uh, and them going out and spreading the gospel and, and, and many being saved. But in addition to that, uh, we have the two witnesses which will be called um, Jews back to salvation. We see the seventh trumpet there at the end of chapter 11. Uh, and uh, we see all of these, these things that are taking place. I want to move quickly here. Uh, but we see the woman and the dragon. The woman is uh, in, in, in chapter 12. The woman being Israel and the child that the woman has being uh, Jesus. And then we see uh, the dragon uh, being Satan. And uh, there's referred to as uh, some, some different things that are, uh, that are difficult to understand. But I think uh, under the context and under the right study, we can come to, to what they mean. And so the, the woman with 12 stars on her head, well, those are the 12 houses of Israel. Uh, and the, the, the child that the woman has would be, uh, would be Christ. Uh, the, the Satan with the seven crowns would refer to satanic governments. Uh, and we, we, we've, we've seen uh, those take place uh, with, with anti-Semitism and with the things that have taken place against the nation of Israel and against the world. Um, in Revelation 16, we see the bowls take place. And this is the, the third wave of seven judgments. Again, in the seals, a fourth of the world is destroyed. In the trumpets, a third of the remaining world is destroyed. And then by the trumpets, uh, most of the world is destroyed and judged against for their sin. 
But uh, at that three and a half year mark, which would have been taking place already at this point in the, in the story, uh, it's referred to in Daniel 7, Daniel 9, 27, uh, the Antichrist, who has created this seven year peace treaty with the nation of Israel, uh, breaks it, declares himself to be God in the temple, and then we see things continue to get uh, even worse. In Revelation 17 and 18, we see the destruction of Babylon, uh, which has been the, the idolatry that was present in the world. We see the spiritual uh, decline of, of Babylon, as well as the economic in verses uh, chapter 18. The economic uh, world system's uh, destruction and downfall. We have in Revelation 19, we have the hallelujah chorus and people are praising God uh, because justice is, is being done. Um, and every person that has ever been wronged, every person that has ever gone through incredible hardship uh, and, and, and gross sin and has been uh, sinned against, everything would be made right because of what God has done. And so we, we sing praise to him. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give the glory. For the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And so the marriage supper of the Lamb uh, I'm not going to dive too deep in this with my remaining time, but there was typically three parts uh, to a Jewish wedding. There was the dowry that was given, the, the, the price for the bride. There was the waiting that took place. Uh, and this is where Mary and Joseph found themselves uh, when she found herself to be pregnant. And then there was the feast and the culmination of that. I believe that the dowry, the payment, was made when Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins. The Father made the payment for the bride. And the waiting is taking place now. And, and it says in Matthew 25 with the, the parable of the ten virgins that they're waiting for the bridegroom. And, and we are waiting for our bridegroom to come and, and to take us, his bride, the church. And then in heaven, I believe we will have this marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, whether it takes place right here at the end of the tribulation, whether it takes place in the millennial kingdom, and, and, and part of through that, uh, I, I'm not certain, and different scholars would say different things, but we do have a celebration of the marriage supper of the land of, of, of Christ and his bride, the church. Armageddon takes place. Uh, Mount Megiddo. Uh, Armageddon just means Mount Megiddo. That's what it literally translates as. It's found in Revelation 16.16. 16. Uh, I, I've had the opportunity to go to Israel and, and get on a mountainside and see the plains of Megiddo and kind of envision what would take place there. But it would not only take place at the plains of Megiddo, but really the length of Palestine. Uh, many of the, the Old Testament wars uh, were fought there, a very significant battleground. And unlike what we see in uh, Hollywood with this, this huge back and forth and Satan's going to win, no, God's going to win. It's a uh, huge buildup and quick fight. Think Mike Tyson in his prime. Huge buildup, quick fight. One knockout punch, it's over. Uh, not worth the $70 you paid for pay-per-view. Uh, so, uh, Christ uh, then separates the sheep and the goats. If I had time, uh, Matthew 25, we would read it. But verses 31 to 46, we read about uh, those going uh, into uh, eternal judgment and those going into uh, eternal life and uh, the, the sheep at that time then are those that enter into the millennial kingdom. Uh, so at the beginning of the tribulation, everyone is an unbeliever. At the beginning of the millennial kingdom, the literal thousand year reign of Christ, uh, we see uh, that everyone is a believer. Uh, but they will want to have children who will still need to trust in Christ. Why did the millennial kingdom take place? Well, uh, a couple of things. Satan is bound during this time, which is very significant. He is not in hell as we think of it. He's in Hades. Uh, and he is in, in torment during this time, but he is not allowed to deceive the nations. And yet we learn from James chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, uh, that sin primarily comes from our sinful nature and when we give in to temptation. And so it will prove that uh, our sin is actually not Satan's fault. It is our own and, uh, and taking responsibility for that. Uh, we have the sheep goat judgment. The millennial kingdom there is found in Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6. Uh, one of the reasons why I believe in a literal uh, millennial kingdom is if you read through this, I'm going to do it. Uh, and it is, Then I saw the angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. In case you weren't sure, he used like four different titles for Satan there. It is him. And bound him for a thousand years. First instance of a thousand. 
and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. We'll refer to that. When I saw the thrones and, uh, and seated on them were those who had the authority to judge uh, was committed. And also the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands, referring to the mark of the beast here. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of them did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is the Holy One who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, for they will be like priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And then verse 7, and when the thousand years are ended. So just in seven verses here, uh, the word thousand is referred to seven specific uh, times by a thousand. Certainly God could have communicated a thousand if it was a figurative, a long period of time. You know, a day is but a thousand years and a thousand years is but a day to the Lord. That is true. Uh, but I think that the specific instances of the word thousand specifically in this context over and over and over uh, would refer to a, a literal thousand year reign of Christ. And that's just one of the reasons. Uh, so I'm going to dive in deep. He's going to give me a five minute warning right now. Perfect. And, uh, and that will give us... Uh, we only have uh, a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred years, and then all of eternity to cover. So we're going to move quickly. Uh, a thousand years uh, reign of Christ. Christ will come and will reign and will be seated on the Davidic throne in uh, in fulfillment of the promises that He made to them. Sin will still exist, although Satan is bound, but things will be returned. Uh, in Romans eight, we have the earth groaning for redemption. Uh, we see that the earth is returned to like Eden, not the same as Eden, but like Eden state. The lion shall lay with the lamb. That reference in Isaiah is referencing to the millennial kingdom, not to heaven. Romans uh, chapter 11 points to the fact that there is a future for Israel. Uh, that Israel is, 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 is uh, currently experiencing a, a time of judgment, but that they will be called back and they will be the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. Uh, I believe that those were unconditional promises. God will fulfill them. And so in the Abrahamic covenant, God promised Israel a land, a posterity, and a ruler, and a spiritual blessing. All of those will be perfectly fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. The Palestinian covenant promised Israel a land and an occupation within the land. And this, again, will take place in the millennial kingdom. The Davidic covenant promised Israel that there would be uh, someone, a king from David's line, who would be seated on to rule forever and give them a, a rest from all their enemies. This will take place during the millennial kingdom. God will be faithful to his covenant promises to the nation of Israel during the millennial kingdom. Could get into a lot more uh, detail in that regard, uh, but following the thousand years, we see the defeat of Satan. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and gathered them to battle their number like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth, surrounded by the camp of the saints, the beloved city. And again, big build up, quick fight. Muhammad Ali says, uh, But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. So the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the, the, the eternal hell, uh, the uh, the, the, the fire, fire lake of burning sulfur before the thousand years, uh, Satan and the rest of the unbelievers are thrown in after that. We have the great white throne judgment, which appears to take place in a place between the old heavens and old earth and the new heavens and new earth. It's here in, in verse uh, 11. Uh, then I saw a great white throne. It's called the great white throne judgment. And him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away, old heaven and no earth. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. At the great white throne judgment, which if you're present at, uh, I'm sorry, you open up the books, and all these books that are full of everything you've ever done will be there. And it will show that you did not follow Christ. And then the book of life will be opened, and your name will be found not corresponding. It's, it's not found in there. This is a judgment specifically of unbelievers. And they will be thrown into death in Hades. In verse 14, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death in the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was, not, or he was thrown into the lake of fire. 
Following this, we have the new heavens and new earth. Give me a one minute warning as well. It's time. All right, one minute. Uh, then we have the new heavens and new earth, and God creates a new heavens and new earth. Uh, it gives a lot of the dimensions and what it looks like. Uh, you can read in verses, uh, chapters 21 and 22. I know we're going to get into this uh, throughout the rest of the conference, but why is all of this so important? Well, uh, the Bible calls us to be ready. And, and uh, uh, regardless of your eschatological view, I think that all, we would all agree in that regard. But what we're ready for might differ. And if Christ is coming again, uh, and we will be taken from, from, from here, uh, we should be sharing our faith with our, with our friends, with our family, and with all that we come into contact with. We should be sure that we are ready um, and our individual walks with Christ, that we are walking faithfully with Him. The Bible uh, talks about it, and it's important to know what we believe and why we believe it, because it can keep us becoming fearful or for falling into traps from false teachers. Uh, I had a woman uh, that I pastored for a time who uh, was so fearful of the end times and of believing that they'll, they'll be going through the tribulation period uh, that she stored up. Uh, Food and bought this expensive generator and was living on very, very little, uh, even though uh, this wasn't necessary. Um, and then uh, to all of us, uh, regardless of the four views, there's, there's heaven and there's hell. And we believe that uh, those are important. So uh, no further ado, that is all I have to say.